All right, welcome to Talk Jitsu with hosts Uki, Mike, Joy Bereski, and me, Jordan Pressinger from Jordan Teaches Jiu Jitsu. Today we have a great episode for you guys, and uh, it's hard to top last episode. I mean, like, last episode had a lot of reactions to it. I, I mean, I guess that's what, you, that's what you could say. A lot of different opinions. And it was a nice little debate. I had a lot of fun. I Like, I like debating, and I like uh, kind of arguing, but, you know, a friendly argument. And, uh, yeah, it was a good time. But, Joey, what's, like, your feelings after, like, seeing people's reactions reactions and whatnot? Uh, yeah, and for the most part, the reactions have been pretty good. Um it's, I think it's really helpful for me. Like when I see the comments and what people's takeaways are, it helps me kind of look back and see what maybe I explained really poorly or what maybe I didn't quite explain. Right. Uh, cause a couple of the, like, there's been a, a few comments that are like the same misconceptions and it's like, you know, I probably just didn't explain that well enough then if more than one person is having the same comment. Yeah, I mean, it can be pretty confusing because I joined the Discord for Ecological, and um, even within them, they're ni- they're a nice group of people, really nice. But even within them, they can have some, um, I guess, misunderstandings, and they're clarifying with each other, like you know what what is like right ecologically and what's what's not. So. Yeah, it's a complicated thing for sure, and uh, I think we should debate again, but like not now because I think um, like what I want to do, like I think I understand it pretty well, but I want to understand it better. Where if someone asked me about it, I could give a very uh, easy answer. Where like right now, it's like it might be kind of confusing even when I explain the whole thing. So yeah, I want to be able to understand it so well that I can explain it very simply. And I think right now that's not so much the case. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. The way you're using it in class right now, I like. I really like how you're doing it. Yeah, we did 100% ecological uh, last class, and uh, it was a good time. Yeah, like, I got one of the ideas from the guy in the Discord for it was this wrestle up. Oh, I'm doing my own, but I like this one a lot too. It was like a the bottom player is trying to get up, and the top player is trying to keep the bottom player down, and also get a uh, body lock. And the top player is trying to yeah get up, um, but they can only go forward; they can't go back. So that, that was a really good drill. Because something like that, it's like, it is pointless to do statically of like, you know, getting the body block, you know, what's the point of like doing that with that resistance, right? So I think that's a great uh, example of something that's great ecologically. And one thing we do, Joey, I don't know if you think there's value in this. I want to get your opinion. And we'll only talk about ecological guys for like 10 minutes, but like, so give us that though. But do you think like we have like punishments if we're losing the game? So it'll be two push-ups or maybe five push-ups or whatever it is. And I like that because it really... um it really clarifies when someone lost, like they really kind of understand it. Plus they get a good workout that way. So one argument could be that's kind of wasting time, but it doesn't really take a lot of time to do. And again, I like that. Uh, I like there being a punishment for losing the game. Uh, yeah, we don't do that. Our punishment is just, you lost the game. Um, some of the games are designed so that you should lose. I mean, uh, like, you know, we played a game the other day when we were working on arm bars where you start in a fully extended arm bar and your goal is to get the finish. Uh, the other person's goal is to clasp their hands together. So, like, if you're starting in a fully extended arm bar and you're getting tapped, like, I can't punish someone for that. Like, you should be probably, like, if the person's doing it is competent, you should be tapping 90% of the time. Uh, so, yeah, we don't, like, the, the punishment is just you've lost the game. Uh, so, like, and I don't want to, like, our games we usually do for about six minutes per game. So I don't want to take any of the time away from that, like switching position or doing anything. I usually want it to be like right back into the next round, right back into it. Just keep going. And do you have them do like where they switch every time? Or do you have like one person is, has the arm bar and the other person defending the whole time. Then you switch after like three minutes or or so. Uh, It depends on the game. Uh, Typically for most games, it'll be one person on one side of the engagement for three minutes and then we'll switch and do three minutes on the other side of the engagement. Um, but if it's something that's going to be like physically taxing in a certain way, so like, let's say, uh, you know, a grip breaking game, uh, where you're trying to break the grip like that, that's kind of tiring on your arm to just try and hold a grip for six minutes. We might switch every time just so people's arms are getting like a little bit of a rest in between rounds and you can actually get like better practice that way. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I think it depends on what it is. Cause that's kind of what I've been doing too. Like sometimes, uh, we switch every time or sometimes it's like this, you know, we switch after the three minutes, who's on top, who's on bottom or engaging and disengaging, whatever it is. But yeah, I I like the, I like punishment because like for me personally, like if I know there's a punishment, I'm going to work way harder to uh, not do that punishment. But yeah, I think it's just a matter of like, 
you know, what, what the coach likes and what doesn't like. They, Mike, do you like doing about, you know, like 100 push-ups by the end of the night? Yes, I actually enjoy yeah. the punishment. And even when I win the exchange, I do the punishment anyways, just so I get an extra 100 push-ups in that night. Yeah. It's just physical fitness. I enjoy it altogether. Yeah, that's something I saw a lot of people doing. Like, <coughs> the other person will lose, but they do push-ups too. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, it's a like great, you know, because I, I think people should get fit on their own time in, in a sense, but... Um, I don't know. I, I like it like this. And we're doing it with the kids too, where they have to do push ups as punishment. And I think they're going to get way stronger, way faster. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I think kids are, especially are motivated by punishment. Like, I don't think they'll do the punishment with their opponent, uh, with their partner. And maybe some will, but I think maybe they might take pride in seeing their partner have to do yeah. the push ups and they're, you know, oh, I, I got you kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I would say about that, that like I wouldn't particularly like is, um, especially with my guys, like I want to encourage them to try different stuff. I want to encourage like variability. Um, And if there's a punishment, people might be less likely to try something they're not sure works because they just want to win to avoid the punishment. So you could end up like forcing people into a very linear path of like, I have one way I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it every single time because I don't want to do push-ups. Yeah, that's possible for sure. It's definitely possible. I mean, it could go the other way too, where like, the incentive isn't enough just like oh yeah i won again you know okay we'll do it again oh yeah i won again you know we're like i don't know i guess it, yeah there's pros and cons to everything for sure i wonder what what greg would say if you would like uh that that push-up type of thing or not i don't know i, I do not know um, i don't think he would <laughs> the other reason we don't do anything like that is uh like i you know it's physically taxing i mean some of these games are hard like uh they're they're physically challenged you're live you're against a resisting opponent and we're going to do this for we typically do at our gym like 45 minutes of game and then we roll for however long people want to stay. And some people maybe don't have the the cardiovascular muscular endurance to do like the hardest full 45 minutes of their life and then roll. So they have certain games where they want to take it down like a couple percentages. And I'm, I'm pretty open to my students like, hey, you guys get to choose how hard you go. Like if you and your partner are both exhausted, you don't have to go like as hard as physically possible just try to win the game but if you both like physically can't handle this and you're gonna throw up take it down a notch relax a little bit like go as hard as you guys need to go and can go without you know destroying your bodies and killing yourselves so uh i feel like if i had a punishment it might like almost encourage my students not to like listen to their bodies a little bit too much because they again they don't want to have that punishment yeah for sure i think what we need to do is compare our students after who's the strongest, you know, after, after well, I guess their, their, their uh, chest muscles, who's, who's stronger. I know that it matters, but like, yeah, because not only who's better, like, you know, like uh, who got better jujitsu from the ecological, but also, yeah, who's stronger. I think mine I'm was also stronger. biased. I'm Here's biased. Why better I can't do, we'll find out. I can't do a push up, So I'm, I'm really biased against that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting seeing like uh, the kids, especially kind of like, uh, don't do the pe- best push-ups, but yeah, you know, they're getting better at it for sure. But the more you do, Joey, you know, the better you're going to be able to do to do them. Oh no, like I can like the strength-wise push-ups not a problem. My shoulder doesn't. Do oh yeah, push-ups. If I go down, I can't go back up. Uh, yeah, it's it's a bit of an inconvenience actually when it comes to grappling. Like it turns out, let having your body parts fall apart is not conducive to a physical sport. No, definitely not. I'm uh, I'm getting an MRI soon on my uh, my knee. My meniscus has been bothering me a lot. I'm pretty confident it's my meniscus, and uh, probably will need surgery. But actually, lately it's been it's been doing pretty good. Like, uh, but it, it was not doing good before, and that's what took me out of the self defense challenge, which was really frustrating, hurting my knee again. But it's been pretty good since then. But yeah, definitely you got to take care of your body, and we're so like we're so like weathered that we know that, but we were so dumb coming up that we we should have we should have done that but do, yeah do my, you ever find it hard when you see like the the young students or like the younger students training like six seven days a week and like really pushing their body and you're like hey man i get where you're coming from i was there i was in the same position as you but like you gotta maybe take this down a notch or you're gonna end up like me with a broken ass body like you know it, it's hard to tell someone who's young and recovers and heals super quick that they maybe do need to like take rest days, take care of their body, do recovery stuff. And they just don't want to listen. Yeah. And tap to submissions, you know, like the adults are pretty good for that. I find, but the kids, I think also because they're more hyper mobile that like they're harder to get hurt. So they really push the boundaries. And 
I'm like, guys, like I got to stop so many submissions, like <laughs> just tap, like it's over. It's good. That's good enough. You know, cause they're not tapping. They, they don't want to. I, I train six, six classes a week and I have a bunch of issues with my back and I just, I just push through it. I know it's probably the dumbest way to go ahead, but uh, I can't do it any other way. It's, it's my, it's my addiction now. So yeah, you probably train more than anyone here. Oh yeah. But I, if I don't go, um, things don't go well inside my head. So that is my, it's my therapy session. It's my workout. It's, it's everything. It's my social environment as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You definitely train more than I do. I've been, I've been lazy lately. I'm not even training gi anymore. Just doing no gi only. I hired someone for the gym. I hired Jake. Um, so he's going to teach all the gi classes and like, uh, do some of the business stuff plus help with the YouTube channel, which really, yeah, helps me out a lot because, and it's just a lot of work. And, uh, because, you know, I teach jiu-jitsu all day uh, working on the YouTube channel, and then I got to teach jiu-jitsu at night plus roll and everything else I got to do. So, like, you know, it helps, like, now I'm going to have certain nights off because he's going to teach instead. Are you done gi forever now or just taking a break or here and there? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, st I'll still train gi on Friday mornings um, just, like, because I still enjoy the gi, but if I had to make my night schedule lighter, you know, it's going to be gi class that's, that's gone. Yeah. yeah. I much prefer no gi for sure. And, uh, one, one thing I'm working on right now, it'll probably be out by the time the podcast is out is a, a study on Nick Ro Rodriguez. It's my first time doing a video like that, where I kind of break down his game plan, what he does, what he's good at, what he's bad at. I'm pretty interested <laughs> to see what people like how they feel about the stuff I said he could work on and stuff that he's not great at. So for example, like one thing he's not great at taking backs, um, you know, not a big deal. Like he's a guard, got a great top game. Sometimes he transitions a little too early and his opponents, uh, time it and then they, you know, get their guard back or, or whatever. Um, but it's just small things like that, you know? And one thing I said too, is that he might want to explore over under passing too, because he's so good at the body lock and getting it, and the same position that you get the body lock from, you can get the over under pass from. Um, so like, I feel like that dual threat would be very uh, helpful, for, helpful for him. But yeah. I'm just curious. People, people are going to say like, you know, uh, Jordan, what do you know? Like in telling a professional grappler, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, I'm curious. Look at Danaher. He never uh, did a tournament or won anything. And he's one of the most accomplished coaches in the world. Right. So yeah, people are dumb though, you know, but like, well, that's the thing who cares. I mean, look at the coaches for most professional sports, like half of them. I think it's uh, only half the coaches in the NBA right now ever played professional basketball. Like your ability to do something athletically at a professional level is not an indicator of your ability to one, be a coach, but two, definitely be an analyst. Like those are different skills too. coaching an athlete and watching athletes and analyzing what do they need to work on? What are they good at? Where are the weaknesses, the holes, the strengths? That's a separate skill. Like any professional sports team has dozens if not more of people whose only job is just to watch tape and then come to conclusions and those guys most of them probably aren't professional athletes they're just people who have a really good eye for detail and eye for what they're looking at and i think it's silly when people say like oh you're not a world champion you can't criticize this world champion like i mean i have eyeballs and i have a brain i can formulate an opinion and whether or not he wants to listen to that opinion that no one's requiring that but I think that's just a silly thing to say. Like you have to have the credentials to criticize someone. Yeah. Those that know, know, and those that don't know are dumb because, and it's mostly people on like Reddit and whatnot. They're like, Oh, you know, like, you know, I just want to follow this and that. I don't know. I complain about this multiple times. So I'll try not to complain too much, but I think it'd be interesting too, to see if any of his opponents watch it, you know, and kind of try to learn from it. Um, so maybe I did him a disservice where like I'm showing like, you know, some of his weaknesses, what he's, what he's good at. And then kind of form like a game plan around him. Like, I think it'd be kind of cool too to like follow it up with like, this would be my game plan against Nikki Rodriguez and, uh, maybe someone would use it or maybe I can roll with him in the future too and see if I can be successful, you know? that'd be fun it does take a certain amount of skill to be able to break it down and analyze it like joey was saying like when i listen to you or watch you uh break down a, a fight or less impressed more involved break down a fight you guys just blow my fucking brain out i can't even think of what you guys are doing when you're when you're coming up with he should have done this he's doing this wrong he's doing that and i only noticed it when you guys pointed out i would never be able to come up with it on my own i know i'm only a purple belt but i can't see even the littlest thing yet yeah, it's funny, like, as a black belt, like, a lot of the stuff seems, like, pretty, like, simple to me. And I'm like, 
not in a conceited way, but where I mean, like, uh, some things I'm not sure people even find interesting because I feel like it's so, like, basic or whatever. So I feel like a lot of times when I explain things, I'm just not sure what, like, the reception is going to be. It's like, is this useful information? Is this not, like, super insightful? Like, is this what everyone knows already? And I think that's the hard part as a coach, too, of, like, not assuming people know things, but also not assuming people don't know things either where you go too basic. Like, that, I think that's a hard thing to manage. Like, I don't know. What do you think, Joey? Like, as a coach, like, do you find that hard sometimes? Like, um, you know, maybe you, you, you say one thing assuming someone knows, like, what you're talking about, but you didn't boil it down simple enough. Yeah, I mean, that definitely happens uh, for sure. Like, that's a pretty common occurrence, I would say. And I think it's it's uh, it can be difficult as a coach because, like, we know how we think and how we see a situation and how we would approach it and the information like that we've gathered through like, you know, years and years and years of doing this, but you don't know ever what's going through someone else's mind. Like uh, I find, especially when you're coaching in a tournament and I'm watching one of my guys, you know, doing something and I'm seeing something I'm like, Oh, there's like a good opportunity for like, let's say like a triangle here. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, I don't know if, he's even thinking about a triangle. He might be thinking about something else and I don't know what's going through his mind and I don't want to like try and guide it. Like you're kind of like, I'll let him do his thing and see if I can help a little bit. But it's interesting how different people view and think about different situations. And I think it, uh, it does change a lot from person to person too. Like I'm sure you and I could watch the same situation. And if someone's like, what could you have done differently here? We both might have a different answer that like both could be right, but it's informed by like our experience and our games and our opinion. Like uh, I think that's something to keep in mind too, is like there's certain guys that I might criticize in certain areas because I have a certain way of doing things that I think is obviously good because it works for me. Whereas maybe they have different like body type, different flexibility, different structure. And they're like, no, that doesn't work. This is how I like to do it. Yeah. I mean, it's like direct per- perception, right? Yep. hundred yeah. percent. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. I think that's one thing that, again, I don't want to debate the ecological approach. I just, uh, or I want to talk about it more like later on, but, uh, that is something I wanted to ask you about like direct perception because, just say like I perceive that uh, like my my experiences are you know showing static drilling can work and that's my direct perception based on my experiences right so like if someone tells me that ecological is better like that's like them telling me the answer but my perception right based off their perception I don't know you know what I mean yeah, so uh, can I actually clarify one thing before we go on? Because this was this is the big thing that was bothering me in the comments, and I've I've responded to probably like a dozen or so people are saying this, and I think there's like a little misunderstanding is, um, and it's about like the things should be like eighty percent ecological, twenty percent static drilling. Uh, ecological dynamics is a theory of how human beings move and interact with their environment. Uh, it's not jujitsu specific; it's for literally any mobile or motor task. Uh, Basically, ecological dynamics states that we move in relationship with our environment and the information we receive from the environment and our body's own capabilities. Uh, You can't extract learning from the environment. So the same way, like if I were to tell you right now how to do a tennis swing, I I know no idea about I have no idea how to play tennis. I don't know why I picked tennis as an example, but I'm going to roll with this. If I were to tell you how to do a tennis swing and you were to practice that motion that I told you a thousand times without a racket or a ball, and then I put a racket in your hand, you're probably going to be really, really shitty at tennis because you're not getting any actual information on how I need to move the racket in relation to a ball, how it even feels to hold a racket. You're just moving your arm in a motion. It's, it's functionally useless. Um, so if ecological dynamics as a theory is correct, which it or information processing, people want more information on information processing, they can look it up. In my opinion, it's an outdated form of science, but there's some minor debate. Ecological dynamics seems to be the way to go. All learning for motor tasks is ecological. It has to be. That's the only way humans learn, whether it's static drilling, whether it's rolling, whether it's uh, constraint led games. It's all every all bit of learning is ecological. Uh, So you can't have 70% ecological, 20% not. Everything you do is ecological. So your learning from static drilling would be ecological. The argument against static drilling isn't that it's not teaching you ecologically. It's that it's not representative of the live environment. So it would be like playing tennis, practicing the tennis swing without holding the racket. 
Sure, you're practicing the motion, but you're not getting the information from the environment, which is the weight of the racket, the wind resistance, the angle of the ball. Uh, that you can only get when you're actually in a live environment. Like my opponent is resisting. Uh, so that's kind of just something I wanted to talk about when people say like 80, 20 for ecological, not ecological, like either we learn ecologically a hundred percent or we don't learn ecologically at all. Uh, and I think that's, I, I, my experience in jujitsu would be that we definitely learn ecologically because like, obviously we all agree you need some form of live component to get good at this sport. If we didn't need that, then information processing would be a more likely response. Yeah, for sure. I think that where like the confusion comes from is just uh, like, yeah, people equate ecological with like the games and not with the static drilling because people that are proponents of ecological are against static drilling for the most part. And so it, it makes it seem like static drilling is not ecological, but it is. Um, so yeah, it's just like the terminology can be confusing. Like I knew that going into the podcast, but I figured it's just easier to say ecological. But then I realized after, because people didn't really appreciate that, like the di differentiating that that wasn't the way to do it. So um, yeah. yeah. And like, uh, I think that's something that like when we had this conversation, we just kind of use these terms and these words because it's, it makes for a functional conversation where we're not yeah. spending an hour and a half debating the semantics of certain words and like, Oh, you're using this word slightly erroneously. And then we spend 15 minutes discussing how to define a word. We actually want to have a conversation that moves forward. Um, but for people listening an ecological training or training that's ecologically sound is any training that assumes perception is direct from the environment. Uh, if you're assuming that there's information in the environment uh, and you're training according to that assumption, then your training is ecologically sound. Yeah. And it's based off your perception. Right. Because if someone tells you something is right, this is what you're saying that like you can't learn it till you perceive it and then organize those. Uh, I forget what it's called. Like, I guess your thoughts in your head. I don't know. Yeah. Basically, like uh, it's you're taking your own body's ability to move and what you can do and what you know, along with the information the environment's giving you. So like uh, I, I like to use this example, like because uh, I think this is a really good example and kind of explains it for people who don't know is uh, learning to walk. Uh, Jordan, you've got a bunch of young kids. When you tell teach them to walk, you don't go, all right, you're going to take your right foot, move it six inches in front of your other foot, transfer 75% of your weight, move the other foot. That would be no kid's ever going to learn how to walk that way. What you do is you go, hey, buddy, come this way. Like, come on, come on over. And they'll take a couple steps and they'll fall over. And then you go, oh, good job, good job, good job. You get them back up and they'll try it again. And what's interesting about walking is that once you learn how to walk, you can do it on pretty much any surface. Uh, you can walk. We Most of us learn how to walk on a flat floor in your house where your parents are trying to get you to walk. But I can walk on grass. I can walk on rocks. I can rock on un, walk on unstable surfaces. I can walk on things that aren't level. And I never really have to think about this because the environment is giving my body information on like, hey, this isn't flat. Shift your weight so that you don't just slide off and fall down and die. You, you adjust the way you walk to the environment and you need that information from the environment. Uh, so that's kind of what ecological dynamics says. It's like, it's what you're capable of doing, uh, your own experiences, your abilities and the environment that all kind of mesh together to teach you how to move in relation to that. Yeah, exactly. But just say like, uh, okay, I don't want to debate today, but just say, um, you know, there's like a, a better way to walk. There's like best practices of like walking. You want to learn how to be like a speed walker and someone can tell you to go uh, heel to toe. I don't know if that's the best way to walk, but I'm just saying they tell you go heel to toe. And then that's what you do because you based off your perception, your direct perception of like them telling you like them being an expert. Okay. I'm going to listen to you because I understand that uh, you know what you're talking about. So then you start going heel to toe when you walk, as opposed to maybe before you were going like walking on your tippy toes or something. So like you don't need to like, like would you, you can just be told that and start doing it because it's the best practice. But you have to do it is the thing. So yes. when you get told it, just because I say walk heel to toe, it's a better way to walk. doesn't mean you necessarily know how this works. You have, uh, this is something we use a lot, especially in my gym, uh, the difference between knowledge of and knowledge about. 
So knowledge of a subject is if I tell you walk heel to toe, you have knowledge of that now. You have knowledge that that might be a good way to do this, but you have no knowledge of what the experience of walking heel to toe feels like or how I adjust that to different surfaces, what kind of shoes I'm wearing. You actually, to truly learn about how walking, and walking is pretty straightforward. Uh, This is maybe not the best example, but it's an analogy I like. Uh, You're given information. You attune your action and your senses to that information, and then you try it. And the real learning comes from actually doing it. The telling you was just kind of a guide to how to do it. It wasn't actually teaching you how to do it. It was you doing it was what taught you how to do it. Yeah, but for, for that example, you could like practice in a low stress environment of like just okay heel toe heel toe instead of just going right away to like walking heel toe like that's not a great example because that's probably as easy thing to do right yeah so and there's great. there's no uh obviously like in walking there's no opponent resisting you like typically when i walk during my daily life no one's running around trying to trip me or push me over uh the cat actually might be trying to trip me she's kind of crazy but in general you can just walk uh standard but if i were to tell you you need to walk you know, on a heel toe on a tightrope. Like at some point, you're going to have to get a tightrope out and practice walking on that tightrope. Like yeah, the best exactly. way to do it might be to find ways to mitigate the dangers of what could go wrong. So I'm not going to put the tightrope at the top of two buildings. I'm going to start with it an inch or two off the ground. So if I fall, I don't get hurt. And that's kind of what the, the constraint led games do is I'm taking these skills still in the live environment, still walking on the tightrope, but instead of hanging it from the buildings, I'm keeping it nice and low. You know, we're not in a live role. We're in a very constrained game working on a very particular task. And if you lose, there's no danger, no damage. We're learning how to do it in that live environment. But yeah. And with the tightrope, like you could practice without being up high at all first, right? You could, you could do a lower stress environment being like, six feet off the ground and then you could also be told best practices before you actually go and do it like you could research them and say okay these are what other people do that are good at this i'm going to do this too yep. so and that's I, the constraints of the the games are basically i'm giving you my best practice like uh, i'll use an example from last night's class we did uh kimura just kimura finishes top or bottom doesn't matter they're basically the same technique to me um one of the big things i'd say is for our first game we start, so when I teach submissions, we start with the end game scenario. Uh, so the end of the submission. So like for Kimura, I'm starting with my Kimura grip fully locked, arm is separated from the rest of the body out on an angle. And our goal is just to control and keep that position as long as possible. Top other players trying to connect their hands or free their arm. Um, so when I would do it, I would say, all right, guys, we're going to start from this position. A little thing that might help you is make sure you have a good pinch on the back of their tricep. Make sure there's not a lot of looseness. Make sure their arm's on an angle. If their arm is straight, we're going to have a problem. So something to keep in mind, something to be attuned to as you're doing this drill. But, you know, invariably when white belts try this at first, like the arm gets loose and the guy starts escaping. and They'll go, oh, the guy got out. And I'll go, was your arm still tight? And they'll go, oh, no, I didn't do that. Okay, I'm going to try that. Did I have more success? So uh, ecological doesn't say I can't give you information. It just says you don't learn solely from the information I gave you. The information is a tool that you're taking to apply to the live situation where you actually learn. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. But one thing that like... Like on the Discord, they were saying my approach wasn't ecological because, for example, we would do like arm bar grip breaks, like the ecological game that uh, like where Greg Sauters, I basically mimicked his class. But then I also showed like tried and true arm bar grip breaks like after they practiced and they went back to the games. But they said because they gave them the answers that violates, you know, what the whole point of it. And, which I don't really understand. I think it's great to give them like tried and true historical emergence like these things work. I mean, I think I understand where they're coming from a purely scientific standpoint. I mean, and I do this with my room sometimes if I'm showing something and no one's having any success, I might be like, all right, guys, here's something we could do, an approach we could take, uh, some information that might help you guys approach this. And we're going to go back to the same game now. But with this extra information in mind, I think the the only thing I would agree with them on there is like if you show someone a specific way to do something, you almost, uh, how do I want to say, it forces people into doing something a very specific way and it removes that um, their like attention to the other information. So like, let's say you're showing a grip break where I have to rotate the arm or something. I, I, this is hard to explain via words, but some sort of grip break where I'm like rotating the hand to pull them apart. If the person I'm rolling with has a really good grip 
uh, and especially has like a strong resistance to rotation, that might not be the best grip break. But because you sh like told them to try this specific one, they're trying something that's not optimal based on the information the environment's giving them. Again, I don't think it's necessarily wrong or right. I don't think there really is uh, an answer for like what's wrong or right. I think you have to give people what you as a coach think they need. Um, and I think that's what will make better coaches or worse coaches. I mean, good coaches will be really good at realizing what information do my students need and giving them that information. And bad coaches will either not give enough information or give way too much information that'll cloud the training. So it's, uh, you know, it changes the role of a coach slightly from ways things have been done in the past, but there's still room for like, you know, if every coach switched to using an ecologically based training method, like you're still going to have good ones and bad ones just because of your ability to like read an environment. And I'm sure when uh, I've been talking a lot and I apologize, I'll shut up here in a second, but uh, I'm sure when you're showing the grip breaks, you're seeing a lot of things where people are struggling the same way. So when you're showing them, Hey, this is a tried and true way to do it. You're addressing the problem you're seeing. You're saying, Hey, you guys are all doing the same thing. You're struggling. Here's a solution. Like uh, we actually did grip breaks the other day. So the same thing I start with, all right, guys, guys, a grip. We're starting in the armbar position, trying to break the grip. I'll watch three or four grips where they're pulling on the elbow. And like, you know, if someone's got a grip with their hands and you're pulling at the elbow, it's actually really hard to break that grip uh, unless you're doing something wild somewhere else to break it. So uh, instead of showing them a specific way, I'll come around and say, hey, guys, instead of pulling at the elbow, let's try and attack the connection. Let's attack the things that are actually holding together, the, whether it's the hands or if they're grabbing a collar or they're grabbing their bicep. I have to attack where it's connected, not at the elbow closer to the end of the connection. Guys will try that. They'll have more success. If they're still struggling, I might give them a specific way like, hey, here's something you could try. Just give it a try. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But this is something you could try. Yeah, exactly. So it seems like as much as you can, you try to ask questions that lead them to getting the answers. But if you need to, you'll tell them uh, like exactly how to do something. Yeah, like I'll. what I always like to, I use this analogy a lot with my students is like, do you know anything about mountain climbing? No. Okay. I know nothing about mountain climbing, but I know if you go to like Mount Everest, there's like the Sherpas, like the little, I assume they're like indigenous fellows there that, uh, they like guide you to the top of the mountain. I always tell them, my students, I'm like a Sherpa. I will help guide you the right way. If you're like, you're going the wrong way. I'd be like, Hey, maybe we should go this way. This seems a little bit safer, but I'm not actually like picking you up and carrying you to the top of the mountain and being like, look, you did it. You climbed. Cause I did all the hard work. And then you just followed along. You've got to do the work. You've got to climb the mountain. You've got to figure this stuff out. You've got to figure out where to put your hands, how to grip, but I'm here to help when you need help and push you back on that right path. Yeah. Because sometimes someone can't get to the top of the mountain and you have to, you just, sometimes you have to do for them. Like, you know, Frodo and Sam, like Sam had to carry Frodo up the rest of the mountain, but Frodo w went most of the way, you know? So like, sometimes it can be very helpful, you know, to get the ring destroyed to like, to help someone. Right. But like not always, because sometimes it is better for them to, you know, as much as they can go up that journey, but give them a little push or look hairy for sure. Yeah, I, I haven't had that problem yet where someone's not able to get it. And I, I tell my students, you know, if we're doing a three minute game and the goal is complex because like some games, the goal is actually going to be really difficult to do. And some games, the goal is going to be easier to do, you know, like uh finishing an arm bar when we start with a fully extended arm is much simpler than starting someone in mount and trying to get to the arm bar position. There's a lot more things that change. There's a lot more steps. So if we're starting with a game that has a lot of variability uh, and is difficult, I'm okay if someone tries for the full three minutes and can't get it as long as they're trying and trying good things because, hey, we're going to play this game again a week, a day, a month, some, at some other point. You're going to get more experience from there. If everyone only had to play each game one time and they all of a sudden knew how to do everything. Like jujitsu would be really boring. Cause we'd be done in like a month. Everyone would just know every technique. I wouldn't, I wouldn't need to do anything. Well, I find that does make jujitsu more boring. Like this, like the better I get, the more boring it becomes because I just do the same shit always. And just like, okay, another arm bar, you know, another this or that. And so, you know, especially against like blue belts, like I said before, uh, every time I roll the blue belts, I know they're going to give me the underhook when they're trying to knee slide. And it's just like, okay, Again, yeah, I got I got the underhook. Okay, now I'm, I'm dogfight. It's like it, 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 yeah, that's the problem. It gets kind of boring, but not like where I don't like jujitsu anymore. But I wish it still had that kind of excitement, trying to figure s stuff out. 
But it took you years to get to that point. I'm sh- I'm assuming. Like I know when I was a blue belt, jujitsu was not boring for me. It was still like, oh man, like the the purple belts, the brown belts, they're still they're you know they're beating me. So I got to do some stuff. And even now, like uh, the fun thing about the constraints games is like when I have to hop in, like I can constrain a game so that it's like almost impossible for me to win, and then I'll hop in there with like good white belts or blue belts. And I'm like, yeah, this is actually really difficult to win. I'm putting myself in a position that is like extremely difficult for me to deal with and trying to figure out ways to get out of it. And it's good because it gives them experience on the other end of that. So I I think this has been like fun for me as a practitioner too. Yeah. And I want to clarify one thing too, just because I I don't think it was super clear in the last episode that I'm not arguing against, uh, against uh ecological like against games and stuff i'm arguing for the value of uh static drilling so i'm not saying what you're doing is wrong whatsoever i think that i'm just saying what i'm doing is not wrong either that that's all i was saying so i just want to make that clear but um I, yeah i want to explore this more when like um when i have more experience with it as well because we've been doing a lot like one problem i find uh for me personally i don't know if you experience this too joey that uh, ecological there's two main cons for the coach specifically the coach one everyone's already like warmed up and had like a great time while i'm just like doing nothing and i'm like i'm cold and you know they that's kind of sucks for me and also it's more boring too where like you know it's kind of fun it's like fun teaching techniques and stuff like that and uh not as much fun everyone's just drilling well, playing games and, uh, I'm going around, you know, I'm making sure, you know, everyone's good, but like for the most part, they don't need me so much where they kind of need to be more before we did more static drilling. So I find it more boring, uh, and more fun for them. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. I mean, for sure. Like, uh, for the first point you said, like everyone's, you know, like we do 45 minutes of games and then we hop into rolling and like these guys have been moving hard for 45 minutes and I'm, I've been walking around. I've been helping people. I might've moved a little bit, but like my body's still pretty cold. I have to be really careful with who I do my first round of the day with because I'm still cold and they're fully warmed up. And not only are they fully warmed up, they've been playing games and winning and losing and they're, they're, you know, you know how it is. You, you have a, by the end of a rolling, so like they're amped up, they want to go. And I'm like, ah, I'm not stretched out. I'm not loose. Like I'm, so I do have to be really careful with who I go with, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, that's the one thing that really sucks for me is everyone else is warm and I'm not. And then I got to hop in there to roll and the injury risk might go up, but I just have to be really careful with who I pick for my partner. The heavyweights don't get the first round. Sorry guys, you guys got to wait. Um, and for the other part, yeah, like I had, I think I mentioned on my podcast with Greg, I had like a little bit of an existential crisis when I started doing this because I just felt like I wasn't needed as much. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I don't want to phrase it poorly, but like, when I would show techniques before, like the old, especially way before we really got involved in this or like years ago, like I always felt really like almost important because you're showing a technique and people are like, Oh, it's not working. And then I'm the guy who comes around with like the magic details that help make it work for you. And I have all this information and you feel really needed this way. Like I make the game and then they go off. And then, I mean, there are days, especially if I explain the game really well and it's a, a well put together game where like, I explain the game and then I'm just literally not needed until the end of the game to explain the next game. And it kind of feels, I don't know. It feels weird. It's, I don't want to say like it feels bad, but it's something I had to come to terms with of like, my role is slightly different now. I'm not the guy who has all the information. I'm the guy who makes the games and can help if you need it. But if I do a good job and my games are well made and my students are, you know, open-minded and exploring and really attentive to what's going on. I might not be needed all class other than just the explanation of the games. Do you think it's possible in the future that like you wouldn't even be needed at all where like you could just have your kind of game game curriculum set up like of like for the day like on like I don't know TV or like written down and they just follow the drills and their did or the game sorry and they just do that the whole time you're not even involved at all. Maybe actually, I mean, I've had a couple of people cover classes. I've been, I had one day where I was like kind of sick and I need someone to cover a class. And I just kind of, the guy who was in charge was like, what do you want me to do? And I just kind of sent him the games and was like, do these. And then he was like, all right, I got it. And then it, class went really well. And you're like, all right, great. I wasn't there. That makes me feel really crappy that I wasn't needed and class went well without me. But uh, I think there'll always be value for having someone there who 
can attune, like I said, if someone's having difficulty with things, who can give you the right information when you need it uh, to kind of bring you back on track. And I think that's something that like, you know, a, a blue belt could run the games that we run. A blue belt could run our class, but they might not be able to give you if you're like, hey, this isn't working, like I'm trying to break the arm bar and it's the grip's not breaking, they might not be able to go like, oh, you need to attack the connection, not the elbow. So let's slide up closer to that connection and attack that in a way. Uh, so I think there'll always be a place for like the, the coach who can give the right information at the right time. As a student who's doing the games, I find it's very, very good to have somebody there that I can ask. Like last night, I didn't know the proper way to, uh, you know, clasp for a body lock pass I, I don't do it very much i just started doing it and we were doing the games and i kept failing and failing i said jordan what do i do do i grab this way and you give me a little tip and then boom it helped me right on the right path so i i don't think you're going to be uh phased out anytime soon yeah i hope not because it's also like you know my career on the line of like even like youtube because i kind of had an existential existential crisis too in a sense of like listening to the podcast with you and, and greg i'm thinking shit like if ecological like doing it is like the approach and being told what to do is not right like that's what i do or that's what i do on youtube i teach people how to do things and it's like am i not needed but yeah i think i think that's why i also had like an initial kind of like uh my reaction is like uh i don't know i don't know what the word to use like not super like thrilled about it not like i was mad or anything which is like what is going on so like yeah that's why that's also why i uh well that's the main reason why i went on such a deep dive like again like 10 hours of his podcast i still don't understand it as much as i wish i did which is again why i want to wait till later to understand it even more because i think this like the whole idea of uh perception and all that kind of stuff is very interesting too but like yeah how, how like joey how is uh like online instruction and instructionals how do they play into into all this so i actually think like uh i think it's super valuable and i i don't know if other people in the ecological space would agree with me this is like again i'm not an expert on this i mean this is like a whole field of science and like i don't have a phd in this stuff i'm just a guy who's read as much stuff as i can like get my hands and eyeballs on and tried to absorb as much information as possible um, and tried to understand it. As, I'm sure there's things I don't understand fully, but I'm, I'm doing my best in this space to be as earnest as I can. But uh, I really do believe that, especially with the ecological approach, there is a ton of value in online content because it attunes your intention and attention, as Greg likes to use those words. Um, I think they're kind of fitting for this, but like I watch a ton of content. I watch probably more <laughs> jujitsu content than most humans alive do. Um, and for me, like it's good for my students if I'm if they're in a certain position and they can't figure something out, like maybe we were doing something for arm bars for the whole class and they really were having trouble figuring out solutions. I'll tell them like, hey, man, when you're at home, you know, Jordan's got a video on an arm bar. Go watch this. And I'm not saying try to mimic exactly what you do, but look what people who are better grapplers than you do and see if you can get ideas about Maybe not necessarily like I'm trying to follow the exact same like 10 step process someone else follows, but what are they doing? What are they thinking about? What are they, you can see from these videos, like uh, especially the ones where I watch you roll and you break it down. I don't necessarily care about like the steps of the move. What I'm trying to look for is your thought process in certain positions. What is, and like same thing when I watch like a Gordon Ryan instructional, I'm not, I'm not built like Gordon Ryan. Uh, anyone who's met me could probably attest to that. Well, maybe now that he's off the sauce, I might be built a little bit more like him, but uh, a little shade thrown there. Um, so like the exact way he does certain things won't necessarily work for me, but I'm going like, what are the common themes? What is he thinking about doing? What is his approach? You know, like if he's going for leg locks, is it really important that he controls the hip or the knee, or is he looking to separate the feet? When is he looking to, you know, catch the toes for the heel hook? Like, uh, this online content gives you an insight into another person's mind and really lets you take what they're looking for and try and maybe have that as a slight like influence on the approach to what you're looking for when you're in those situations. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Exactly. That's a, that's a great point. And one thing I wanted to ask you too is like, cause I don't quite understand. I want to, like you said on the podcast with Greg that you do, when, when you do private lessons, you like to do a lot of um, video study, which I think is great too for private lessons. But to me, it seems a little bit like less 
direct perception than doing it with like with them like live or like telling them, or a, a traditional private lesson. It's like it's less because it is way more mental. So like I don't understand how that like I think it's great, but I don't understand how it plays into like you know your ecological the ecological approach. Yeah, so like this is kind of something interesting, and I do this even actually with my live privates. A lot of my students will uh, could attest to this. We don't typically do a ton of moves, uh, and a lot of our privates typically don't have a ton of live grappling. Um, I look at private lessons less like a practice where it's like, hey, we're going to do a bunch of moves. We're going to try and basically mimic a practice designed for you in this like 45 minute span. What I like to do with them is uh, take an idea. So I had one student. I don't want to name drop him because I don't know if he's okay with it. But uh, He was struggling with a specifically one of our other students who's really small and really fast. And he, this student's a little bit bigger of a guy. And he was like, yeah, he just keeps like passing my guard like instantly like I, I don't know how to deal with him he's too fast he's moving too much i'm like all right record around and send it to me we'll to have a private lesson we'll talk about it and the big thing i noticed when i watched it right away is when you're playing guard you're not making connections on this guy you're letting this small fast guy move around you completely unimpeded so basically all we talked about was like hey when we're playing guard connections are important and thinking about what our connections do like uh I'm um, really big. I've done this lesson with like 10 people now. So it's, it's pretty uh, well versed in my mind is like um, when we're playing guard, you can have two different kinds of connections. You can have pulling connections. You can have pushing connections. Uh, they do different things. If I'm playing with someone who's super fast, maybe I don't want to play a guard where I'm pushing him away from me and letting him move around. I want to play a guard where maybe where I'm getting good grips, good controls, slowing this guy down. Same thing if I'm small and I'm against someone who's like really big and strong. I typically don't want to play a guard where I'm pulling this guy into me and pulling him. I might want more posts or more things that keep him at a distance where his weight's not as much of a factor. So we'll talk about that and then we'll kind of just like pop into a position. All right, now I'm just going to pop into your guard. Show me what you think this like get connections and then we'll get connections. We'll play. I'll be like, see right here how you're posting. That's fantastic. You're keeping me at a distance. I can't get close. Uh, and then we'll be like, all right, now I want you to switch to like pulling connections or hooks, grips and see if you can pull me in tight. That's all I want you to do is just try and pull me in tight. Use whatever connections you need to do to do that. So uh, my private lessons become almost more of like a, kind of like your concepts and theory course, just like explained in person to people. Because I think that's what the real value of them is. I mean, like if someone's like, I'm struggling with arm bars, like, hey man, we're doing an arm bar class tomorrow night. Just come to that. And you're just going to fix your problem for arm bars. We're going to play the games. Whereas uh, in the private lesson, I really get to go deep into someone's game and not necessarily like the moves they're using, but their approach to grappling. Yeah. Because I think that Jitsu has a, a big mental component to it because you know, it's not just your body moving. Like, you know, you have to think too, while you're doing it. And, um, I feel like that part of it is kind of left out when it comes to people that are proponents of the ecological approach. I think at least that's what it, the way it sounds because like, yeah, when it comes to finishing mechanics, um, I think like there's mental in that. It's like, oh, I can feel I have the soft part of the neck. I know I'm good to go. And again, I think I stated before that static drilling can be a good time to uh, get that feeling for it. So I think that it is direct of um, or directly applicable some certain static drilling situations to um you know live because the feelings are going to be the same and there'll be mental cues so that that's kind of where i'm hung up still like not uh fully embracing no or at all static the like the end of static drilling yeah so i have two things i want to touch on one i do think um like I try and tell my students and people I talk to that there are two components to jiu-jitsu. There's like the physical and the mental side. And the mental side is like uh, how you're approaching grappling. Like um, I tell people we play the games to become really good problem solvers, but that doesn't help if you don't understand what problem you're trying to solve or mm. if you're trying to solve the wrong problems. Like you can be the great problem solver, but if you're dealing with the wrong thing, we got a problem. And uh, for this guy specifically in that private lesson, like, he was trying to solve the problem of like keeping this guy at a distance. And I was like, that's not the problem you need to solve here. Like this guy is quick and he's a good passer. Like you need to tie him up. You need to connect to this guy if you want any chance of slowing him down. So picking the right problems, like these are the difference between like techniques and tactics. Like tactics is really important as much as people want to pretend it's not. Uh, and the second thing is like uh, around the submission finishes. So, um, like we move from situations uh, like certain situations are what we call more variable. So like if I put you in guard, 
uh, that's a very, very like an open guard. Your job is like, let's say again, what you're doing is very variable. There's tons of ways you can pass. There's tons of ways you can move. You can go down to your knees, up to your feet. There's tons of different ways your partner on bottom can iterate their guard. So there's a lot of variability there. Um, things like submission mechanics, there really isn't much variability. Um, ultimately, like every submission has a couple mechanics. Like I'm going to use armbar an example because I've been, we did a bunch of armbars all week. So I'm kind of like in that headspace but like at the end of the day with the arm bar i need to control the shoulder i need to control the end of the lever and i need to put a pressure on the elbow there's a couple different ways that can look but they, that has to happen and i can explain that to my students because it's invariable like that's not something where it's like does this maybe this changes maybe this is different like i don't really necessarily care like how they orient like if someone's arm barring if they want to grip like with a hug around the wrist or they want to grip two hands on the wrist you need to control the wrist and you need to put a pressure into the elbow. I can tell you these things because they're what Greg calls invariants. They don't change. And like you said, it's the same with like chokes. Like you need that squishy part on the side of the neck. Like that, I, I can tell you that because that does not change. That's not going to be different from choke to choke. Like if you're trying to choke and you don't have, like we did uh, triangles last night. And one of the first details I say is like, cause we start in a, a lock triangle and I was like, your triangle's not good if you don't have a good bite on this side. If your thigh isn't touching the side of this guy's neck, this is not a locked triangle. This is just a, an orientation of your legs. First goal, we have to make sure we have that tight. If that comes loose, before you can do anything else in the game, you must get that connection back on the squishy side or you're never going to submit this guy. So you can kind of like, I know like this is something you've got hung up on and I think it's maybe hasn't been explained well enough to you, but like, especially around submission finishing mechanics, you can actually give more and more information because the situation is less variable. Yeah. And that's what I was saying on, on like discord, especially um, having friendly, uh, friendly debate there. And basically they were saying that uh, no, it's a finish is a finish and they don't really care about the, like, that's what it sounded like. They don't, they don't really care about the finer details. Like, because did you get the tap pretty successful? That's good enough. When I'm like, no, like, <laughs> that's not true. Like, you need it to, to be perfect. Like, and but they don't think perfect exists. Um, and I think you you also don't think that Joey that like a perfect technique exists. But I think it I think it does. And uh, especially when it comes to chokes, like arm bars are a good one. Like they're a really good example, or really for to as a proponent for the, the ecological approach, where like it doesn't vary that much at all. Um, it's, and it's not that complicated. Like it, it's, it's, you pull the arm down. Like it's like, you can teach like a kid that in like, two, you know, five minutes, but like a guillotine, there's so much more finesse involved where I think that it's good to learn that and practice in a low stress environment. I know, you know, we already talked about this, but I just want to reaffirm my stance, but yeah, I don't really get that. Like where they're saying like, a tap is a tap. Like, and that's, that's, is that what you think too? Uh, I, I want to be as like honest as I can with this. So I don't necessarily think there's one universal perfect. I do, however, think that there's a perfect way for each individual to do something. And the correlation is like, um, you know, if I've got a guy whose arms are super long, his choke is going to look slightly different than mine. Uh, but he's going to still meet those like the principles we talked about, like you need the enclosure on the side, you need to apply pressure in a certain way. It has to go the right direction. Like those things that make the way you do it perfect for you will make the way he does it perfect for him. It might look slightly different. A grip might be in a slightly different place just because of like body mechanics or the length of this man's arms. But ultimately it's, it's still hitting the same principles, you know, like, um, and I think that's, that's more what I mean when I say I don't think there's like a universal perfect. Like uh, I've got some guys at my gym who are like, we got some big boys, uh, Alberta strong, Alberta beef boys. Um, and their choke looks way different than mine because the size of their arm is just like way different than the size of and length of my arm. But I'm really like when I, when we go through the games, like, and we play around the choke mechanics, like, I don't care how it looks, but you have to meet these mechanics. Like we said with the triangle, like if you don't have a good bite, that's not going to be a good triangle. I can guarantee you if you don't have a good bite with that thigh, it will not be a good triangle. Now, where your feet slide, and again, like another thing we do with the triangle is when I lock it, I want to cover the shoulder. I want my shin to go as 
parallel across their shoulders as possible. So the game we play is, all right, I'm going to start with my bite, start with a grip on my shin. My goal is to lock this while seeing as little of his shoulder as possible. For my guy who's, you know, maybe 6'6", like his feet are going to lock and orient in a slightly different way than my person who's 5'2", but they're still making sure that those mechanics, like I'm locking with my shin as parallel as possible. I'm not saying like, oh, the guy can just lock it like along the guy's back at a 45 degree angle. That's going to be a shit triangle. And I'm going to try and optimize that out. But certain things are going to change from person to person. Yeah, exactly. And I don't think otherwise either, really. I think there are some some small variations. But I think overall, the way you do it, in my opinion, is very similar and it's worth teaching in a low stress environment. I know we disagree on that, uh, but it's, it's all good. I actually think we, in a way we do agree. Um, we think there are fundamental things that you have to do. Uh, it has to be done and it needs to be done preferably in a lower stress environment. That's why, especially around when I teach submission mechanics through our games, I constrain the game so tightly and small that there's less and less variability. Like when we're actually working on the finishing mechanics of our submission, I tend to actually drop the game time down from three minutes per person to two per person because you're going to get probably like 20 or 15 finishes because of the way the game is constrained. Um, like when we're doing triangle, like we do all the games leading up. So like, you know, we're starting with our lock triangle, making sure we have a good bite, maintaining the lock. And then we're going back into how to lock it up using the games. You know, I'm holding my shin. I'm trying to lock so that it's across as parallel as possible, can see as little as the shoulder as possible. And then the last game we'll always do will be like, all right, now we're in our triangle. We need to get our tap. We understand the functions. You know, I've got my thigh on one side of the neck. I need to put a pressure onto the other side of the neck here. However, I can do it and I need to maintain his posture. You're going to start in your fully locked triangle. You're trying to get a tap person on top. You're just trying to resist this triangle. But like because you're starting in such an unbelievably bad position, there's going to be a lot of taps. I mean, I think we'd probably agree like uh, if I started you with a decent blue belt in a fully locked triangle, completely locked, he gets whatever grip he wants when you start. He's probably going to finish the majority of those triangles. Yeah, or exactly. should. Should. Oh, so it, should. it lowers the stress for the practitioner because you're going to be succeeding. I'm constraining the game in such a way that like, it is almost impossible for you to lose every time. You're going to at least have some success. So it lowers the stress because the situation's less variable. There's less room for chaos. Less things can go wrong. That's true. Do you think this is one thing I want to ask you too? Like, when it comes to static drilling, do you think there could be some more like intangible benefits? Just say like uh, you're doing games the whole class, and a student might feel like they didn't really learn anything, and that's not the case, but they might feel that way, right? Where then they might not enjoy the class as much, or also like if you're doing games the whole time, they might be feeling like, holy shit. I just, you know, worked out for 45 minutes and now I got to roll for 45 minutes where I would have liked to have a break and kind of like uh, a slower pace and kind of think about things a little bit more. So like, even if you don't think that static drilling is good in the sense that it's not as good as a game for skill development, there could be intangible benefits. It's like if you're trying to lose weight, but you just need, you know, a cookie every Friday just to keep you going. That cookie might not be good for you, but in reality, it is an overall net benefit. Like, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you touched on a couple of things like one, I, and I've actually had this happen with a couple of people who've come from other gyms and have done one of our classes and then like, we'll do our games and they'll be like, are you going to like teach something? I'll be like, motherfucker, I already did. Like you've been learning this whole time. Like I, the games have been teaching you. This is what you've been doing. Like, what do you mean? Am I going to teach you something? You just learned more in this class than you learned in 10 of your classes where you're going doing 45 minutes of bridges and shrimps up and down a mat and practicing a static technique that's 55 steps long and you still can't do because I'm watching you roll with my white belts and they're beating the shit out of you. So like, yeah, you're learning. And, but because I'm not showing specific moves, sometimes some people have this feeling of like, I'm not learning because I'm not being given all the answers. And for those people, like so far it's been the major the vast minority of people who've come into my gym, but I'm pretty honest with them. Like if that's how you feel, uh, we might not be the gym for you. I have to do what I think is best for my students and the majority to make them good grapplers. And if someone comes in and they feel like that's not the best way for them to learn or that they're not getting the most out of it, well, I'm not going to change my approach to teaching for one person. So like, there, are, hey man, there are plenty of gyms in the city that do static drilling here. Like you can go to any one of them anytime. Like, you know, you can come drop in here when you want. 
Uh, if you're ever feeling really good about yourself and want to get beat up by some white belts, hey, our gym is always here, man. You can come on at any time. Um, and for the other one, the people who are like, need a break. Yeah, that was the biggest thing when we changed to this is some people had a really hard time with the like, this went from maybe 45 minutes where like 10 minutes of that is actually live to like the full 45 minutes live and then rolling after. Um, yeah, some people roll a little less now. Uh, so the way we do our post class, like we do our 45 minutes of games, techniques, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then we roll and our rolling is open-ended. There's no end to our class. I don't line people up and bow them out. We just, when you're done, you can leave when you don't want to stay anymore. You can leave or you can hang out and chill. And, you know, we've had nights where our class goes an hour and 15 minutes because people are all done after three, four rounds. They're tired. Maybe the games were really taxing and they're like, yeah, you know what? We're all done tonight. No one's staying and rolling. And then we've had nights where we've been there for two and a half hours and there's still people rolling in the corner. And I'm like, guys, I want to go home. Please end this. I really want to go home. I need to sleep. But they're like, no, man, we're competing next weekend. We're, we're going. And I'm like, all right, well, keep going, I guess. Um, and yeah. yeah, it can be a problem for some people. Uh, I tell people go as hard as you need to go as hard as you can. But also if you're tired, take it down a notch. Uh, if you need a rest round, take rest rounds. I'm, I'm very open with my students. Like you are allowed to take rest rounds. Like if you need a round off, take a round off. Um, yeah. And that, that's helped a lot. Uh, and as opposed to sometimes just like going through stuff every night in my gym, invariably as we're rolling, we're three, four, five rounds in and people stop rolling. I'll see a higher belt with a lower belt in the corner and they'll just be playing from a position. The lower belt will be like, man, I keep getting stuck here. What would you do? And they'll just, they're playing in the corner. They're doing their thing. And to me, that's fine. Like that's, that's a part of learning uh, is being like, I just had a round. I just got caught with this thing five times. Can you show me a way to deal with this? And then next time they roll, they're going to try that and it might work or it might not. But that's uh, just part of like kind of the atmosphere of our gym is like, there's a lot of communication. We're really big on that. I know we've talked on podcasts before a bunch on, you know, how important communication is from coach to student, but also student to student. Like you guys got to talk to each other. If I got a guy who's like, Hey man, I'm exhausted from the games. I need a flow roll. Cool. You guys can do that. You've, but you've got to communicate these things with each other. I think you brought up a great point, which I want to touch on it. When I said in the discord, like when I was talking in the discord, the ecological discord is um, I asked them, if say you're rolling with somebody, like you're at open mat or whatever, and you did something that they want to learn, like, oh, that was really cool. Like, how'd you do that? And I asked them, would you do it in a game or would you just show them quick? And they said they wouldn't show them. Like, but would you show them? Like statically to say it was like, man, your arm triangle's so tight. Like, how do you, how do you get it so tight? And, oh, no problem. Come here, uh, I'm, 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 let's do it on me, right? Or would you make a game or would you show them? No, so I will... <laughs> It's going to sound weird. Um, I will show them. But what I explain to them is why I'm doing what I'm doing when I do it. Like if I'm showing my arm triangle, yeah, I move like this way because I want this. Uh, and it's to me, it's the because I want to do this or because I need this. That's really valuable because then when they go back and roll, they can when they're in an arm triangle they can go, oh, yeah, I need to achieve this. It might not look the same way I did it, but they're still achieving the same thing. I'm giving them the important information. Um, the only thing like I would tell people is, and like, this is what ecological dynamics would kind of say about this is just because I showed them how to do it and I told them what to do doesn't mean they know how to do it. Uh, they, I'm giving them good information. I'm giving them a guideline. I'm giving them, uh, things that they can attune themselves to, but now they have to actually take this, go into a live environment and do it and feel it. And things might, you know, hands might grip differently. They might go with an S grip instead of a gable grip in a certain position for a certain thing, but I'm giving them information like, like using a YouTube video. I'm giving you a uh, insight into my mind and how I'm approaching a situation. And that could help you. It might be utterly useless to you, but it's something that you can now take into your own training and try. Yeah. I don't want to like put you on the spot or like, and I got you moment or anything like that, but I'm, I just want to confirm if they asked you, you would show them statically without resistance. Yeah, so I'm, but I'm not going to get them to drill it statically without yeah. resistance is what I'm saying. I'll tell them what I'm doing and why I'm doing, and I'll be like, hey, next time you go roll, try and think about that maybe. that's some, Or next time you're in this position, this is information you can think about. Um, and I think that's fine. Like I think ecological, ecological dynamics says that's fine because it's just information to attune them. 
uh, the error would be if I were to be like, this is how I do it. Now you're going to practice it statically 20 times. And I'm going to assume you now know how to do this perfectly and can mimic it on everyone in every situation uh, live. Cause that's not how we learn, but there's no problem with giving information. And I think that's a, a misconception that maybe some of the people in the ecological space have done a really poor job conveying to people is I'm allowed to give you information to help you figure out problems. Like, me telling you like, hey, when I do an arm triangle, I really make sure I get this good bite. And for me, I like to get as low as possible when I do arm triangles. That's the reason I do that is I find it helps me put my pressure in the right spot. But that's how I do it. That's what works really well for me. Next time you're in an arm triangle, maybe think about that. Maybe you're in an arm triangle and you're like, oh, this guy's not tapping. Oh, Joey said he gets really low. I'm going to try getting low. Did it work? Did it not work? But you have to go to the live environment to really learn it. I'm just giving you information that you can use to attune your learning later on. Yeah, I agree with that. And I find it so interesting how people that are proponents of the ecological approach, how much the, like it, things differ uh, of their opinions and uh, what they think is absolute truth or what has more nuance. I think you have a more nuanced approach, it sounds like, where it's, I think some of them uh, don't and it's just like black and white like do not t show anyone anything they need to figure it out for themselves where other people on, on the discord they do kind of agree with uh, and realize it's a bit more uh, nuanced so it's a hard thing to like discuss like argue or debate when it's not clearly defined what is right and wrong within ecological but I guess it's the same thing in jujitsu it's you know it can be hard to say what's right and wrong yeah, and I think uh, there isn't really a right and wrong. There's a what works. And that's why I think like, uh, you know, ecological dynamics is a framework that explains how we learn and how you're going to express that is going to look different based on your own experiences. You know, uh, your class, like I have different students in my class than say you do. And what my students might like, your students might be like, ooh, uh, that game was, these instructions for this game were not quite clear to me or the way you approached this was not quite clear to me. I have to explain it slightly differently. And I know as coaches, like even using uh, a previous model where we show a bunch of techniques, I'm sure you have students where you explain something one way and they're like, I don't get it. And then you explain it another way and they're like, oh, I get it now. Certain people need different information. They need different cues. And I think as a coach, that's the skill behind ecological dynamics as a coach is knowing what information to give the right people and knowing how to change for your room. Like, uh, if I were to go to another gym and teach like a guest class or a seminar, I would do it pretty ecologically, but I might change some of the words I use, the terminologies, because these are just things I use internally within my gym. I understand my students know what I'm talking about or know what I mean by things, but people at another gym might not. And I think there's a lot of people in the ecological dynamics scene maybe who are maybe they're really smart people and they really understand ecological dynamics, but I don't think they necessarily understand the nuances of coaching uh, because a big part of coaching, like I'm sure you can attest to this is not just the knowledge of the information and how to structure a class, but the knowledge of the people within the class. Yeah, hundred percent. There's, there's a lot that goes into coaching and uh, I think it is more nuanced than, uh, than, than yeah, it's made out to be by some of the people that are, proponents of the ecological approach like i was saying before about like some of the benefits of static of being like people feel like they learn something and people feel like they want to break like we'll end we'll end the podcast soon because it's been, it's been over an hour but i just want to ask one more question like if um just say you did like a survey and you asked your students would you like 10 percent to be static just for the sake of feeling like you learned something even though it's not the case otherwise and also that break um, would do you think it'd be worth it to have 10% if, if you did the survey and people said, yes, we do want that? Or would you just ignore it and do ecological only or games only? Uh, that's a hard question. I mean, I've, I don't know what I would do in that situation. Um, obviously like part of your job as a gym owner and coach is to make sure the students are happy. And like, as much as I believe ecological is and like live situations is how we learn. I also acknowledge that happy people tend to be better learners than people who are disgruntled. Um, so I do think there is a little bit of concession you have to make to make sure your students are happy and like, you know, not to be that gym owner, or that guy, but like I have bills to pay. Obviously I want students in my gym and I'd like to have a bunch of students in my gym, not just for my bills. Uh, but it's good to have more variety of student and sure I could go hard on the, like, 
I'm going to do it this way. I will have zero flexibility. I will do exactly what I want. And I'll have a core group of students that'll love that and they'll be fine with that, but it might really limit the growth of the gym. So I kind of, you know, I'm wearing a lot of hats as the owner instructor. Like you have to find that balance. And I'm really lucky. Most of my students are really bought in on what we're doing. Um, a lot of them have read some of the books and research around it. Uh, a bunch of them listen to this, these podcasts. So and they ask me questions and I'm pretty open with them about talking about it. So, uh, like I'm really lucky to have the group that I have, um, as more students come in, obviously like things might change. Maybe more people are like, I would prefer a static component to this, in which case what I might do to concede something to them is like, Hey, our classes are all going to be run this way. Maybe for 45 minutes on a Friday before open mat, we're going to run a drilling class where you guys can come in and I'll give you a bunch of techniques you can drill and like, I don't think this is optimal, but if this is something that you guys feel you want to do, that this class is specifically designated for that so that I'm not taking away from the people who want to do live training. Like I would add something extra in for my students uh, if that was what they really wanted. Like I'm pretty open with my guys like, hey, tell me what you want. And if it's feasible, I'll make it happen. Yeah, that's a great answer. Yeah, that's uh very, yeah, I don't know. That's it. Basically it's been over an hour and I think it was a pretty good conversation. I didn't want to get into the ecological too much because I didn't want to like, you know, bore potential people that are listening. They're like, oh, another discussion, but I think this was a better one anyways. And, uh, yeah, I think we should not talk about it next podcast, but then like soon we should talk about it again, again, as I've had more experience and as I learn even more about it, I want to learn a lot about like perception and whatnot. Um, I think that's really interesting stuff. So yeah, uh, thank you, Joey. And I also want to uh, also say one thing before it's over. Like I made a joke, you know, Joey said he's not great talk talking to kids. Um, and I said, maybe you should ask someone that, uh, that is good at it and they can tell you how to do it. I was just making a joke because someone said I was an asshole for saying that. And I wouldn't, I would never want uh, people to think I would be little Joey or make a joke at his expense. It was just kind of like banter. That's all. So sorry. Sorry, Joey. No, I mean, I'm not offended by it. I'm, I'm bad at talking to kids. I know this. I just don't understand how they're little kid minds work and I say things I'm not supposed to say I'm really bad for as people can tell by this podcast and some of the things I say I say sometimes words that parents might not want their children to hear um, slips out I'm yeah. bad for that I can't help it uh, and sometimes I use words that children don't understand or don't like man <laughs> I've done it like three times by accident over the last uh, like nine years I've been teaching like three times I accidentally said fuck in front of a student I'm like oh god damn it and I'm right away, yeah, right away, I'm like, sorry, 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 like, because, you know, it just slipped out. And, uh, yeah, I think as Canadians, we especially swear a lot. Um, if anyone's ever watched Trailer Park Boys, that's not, we're not that bad, but I think it's a Canadian thing. So, yeah, I do. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's tough sometimes. My mom listens to this podcast, and every time I talk to her, she always has the same, you need to swear less on the podcast. Like, there could be children watching every time. So I, I'm working on it. I'm trying, guys. If it offends you, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get better at it. But like anything, it takes time. Well, I'm surpri I'd be surprised if any kids are listening to this. And sometimes I'm surprised even adults listen to this. <laughs> you know, but yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening to the podcast. We'll see you guys next time.